Our next guest lives in Austin, has a special place in my heart because I love her so much, Miss Allie Miller. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Hello. So I'm going to be talking about my book that's coming out next month called The Anti-Anxiety Diet. And generally, I'm going to be speaking on anxiety, how we can balance our mind and feel cool and calm and collected. So even if we don't experience anxiety per se to the level of it being disruptive, we can all take tips, as Leanne alluded to, with cortisol and stress hormones and how that can throw metabolism off. It can hinder our ketogenic success, but also just having good ways to be more resilient to the day-to-day -day stressors that we combat every day. So I have a background in integrative functional medicine. I went to a naturopathic college of medicine for my undergrad, and then I determined that I was going to become a registered dietitian. So I have kind of one leg on the bank of the natural medicine world and one leg on the bank of more of the allopathic or conventional medicine world. I have clinically been using the ketogenic diet for uh, about 10 years, since 2009. And I have a podcast called Naturally Nourished, and my clinic is called Naturally Nourished. I run a virtual clinic now, and we still have a, a brick and mortar in Houston. And uh, we have a supplement line and a vending booth. So if you like what you hear and you have more questions, come and say hello. And I'm the author of Naturally Nourished Food as Medicine for Optimal Health. I have copies of that here um, that I'll be signing. And then my book that's coming out in July. So as a functional medicine practitioner, I like to open with this iceberg visual. Um, and this is the way that I look at addressing chronic illness or undesired symptoms in the body. I'm always trying to understand what is the root cause. So I kind of call myself the detective of the body. Everyone has a different triggering event or antecedent or driver that starts to create dysfunction. And then over time, that iceberg starts to peak out of the water and that's where we get diagnostic disease. So as you'll see underlying mechanisms in this iceberg, we see elements like inflammatory imbalances, structural imbalances, micronutrient deficiencies, hormone dominance or imbalance. We see enzymes of detoxification that might be overly taxed or a inefficient liver and gallbladder and kidney system. We can see immune imbalances and then imbalances within our digestive tract, including a uh, microbiome that might be off as well. And I have determined with all of my clinical experience, I may be working on a leaky gut protocol, I might be working on doing stool testing and working strategically with probiotics, or I might be doing an elimination diet with a client beyond the ketogenic approach as a foundation. And I have found that if we don't address stress and anxiety, that is the Achilles heel. And we're just playing whack-a-mole until something else manifests within the system. In fact, my book kind of takes this concept of six different entry points of drivers of anxiety, and it's a very chicken and egg relationship, as if we have dysfunction in those entry points, it perpetuates the problem. So as a for instance, beyond anxiety or stress imbalance being unpleasant to deal with and causing the known things like maybe tremors or insomnia or irritability, difficulty concentrating, we can actually see manifestations on a clinical level. So we see that when we're under chronic unmanaged stress, we get a drop in something called secretory IgA. This is a marker that we can manage in the saliva or we can measure it in the stool and it speaks to leaky gut. I'm, I'm pretty confident most of us in this room are, are somewhat familiar with that term. I think a couple people have mentioned it today. And so when we're talking about a drop in secretory IgA, that means that the mucosal membranes or the lining from our ear, nose, and throat as well as lining our intestines is damaged and we're going to have higher food particles hit our bloodstream and our immune system is going to go haywire and respond with chronic inflammation as well as undesired symptoms of food sensitivity. So we'll actually see that we have more food sensitivity correlation with an individual that has unmanaged stress than someone who is able to manage their mood stability and have more resilience. We also have seen in clinical studies that stress and anxiety actually sterilize the microbiome. 
They did a study with mice where they separated mice from their mamas. And at first they used an electrical shock where when the, the mouse tried to go by its mama, it got shocked. And so there was a physiological stress or an actual impact to them physically. And they saw that lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, these are the two most well-researched positive strains of probiotics, started to degrade to a level of no growth detected. They continued with this study and removed the electrical shock and saw that just the emotional stress alone from a separate mouse population created that sterilization effect in the biome. So when we're talking about the loss of a loved one or we're talking about stress in our day-to-day -day function, knowing that regardless of how well we're eating, that alone can create the sterilizing effect. We also see that we can get a depletion of nutrients from unmanaged anxiety. So we're going to burn through our B vitamins, which have beneficial support for metabolism and energy, so we can start to feel not just stressed and wired, but also stressed and tired. We can see a depletion of glutamine, and glutamine is an amino acid that helps to support the gut lining, so that can add insult to injury with already that secretory IgA coming down. And we can see depletion of magnesium, which is the original chill pill. Magnesium helps with smooth muscle relaxation and depth of sleep, and that helps our body to metabolize cortisol. We also finally see, and I think this isn't even the whole picture, but another influence of stress and anxiety is that we get an imbalance in the HPA axis. And so the HPA axis stands for our hypothalamus pituitary adrenals. And that is our sympathetic nervous system response of our fight or flight mode. So when we're in imbalance of fight or flight and we don't get enough of that balance on the other side of rest and digest, we also have influence on metabolism and reproductive health that are negative. So I want to talk a little bit of statistics before we go into the what you can do about it, but I promise hopefully by the end of my lecture you'll all feel empowered with tools that you'll have to add to your tool belt. Um, but unfortunately, I felt that this book was needed because, like I said, it is the Achilles heel anxiety as far as driving chronic illness, and rates continue to rise. In fact, we've seen a 65% increase in the use of antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs over the last 15 years. This is looking like one in eight Americans over age 12. And we're seeing a higher amount of drugs being prescribed to our children and adolescents. And we're seeing one in four women aged 40 to 50 with the need of use for antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs based on symptoms that aren't managed. We're seeing over 40 million Americans and the rates continue to increase. And unfortunately, what we're not seeing is with this influx of drug prescription, we're not seeing resolution. In fact, research supports that we're seeing the same clinical outcomes from treatment of anxiety that we saw 50 plus years ago before pharmacotherapy was really in the main space. It was usually just talk therapy. So the question is with this hamster wheel, if the treatment is effective, the rates should be going down. And the scary thing beyond that is that drug intervention, especially with children, has a three-time conversion to convert to more severe chronic mental illness. So our treatments are vast as far as pharmacological options, from benzos to beta blockers to tricyclic antidepressants and SSRIs and the new SSRNIs, which are selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, um, monoamines and tranquilizers. But none of them seem to harness the racing thoughts that can go on in the mind. The concern with use of drugs is that not only may they not create sustainable change in outcomes, but they can also create undesired side effects. So we're seeing things like cognitive decline, fatigue, weight gain, reduced libido, infertility, or estrogen dominance and hormone imbalance. We're seeing headaches, muscle aches, and muscle damage and degradation. We're seeing magnesium depletion and insomnia. So in my book, I use a 6R approach. And as I mentioned, there's different entry points, but I use a flow of removing inflammatory foods first, resetting the gut microbiome, repairing the GI lining or the lining of our gastrointestinal tract, healing that leaky gut, restoring our micronutrient status, rebounding our adrenals, and rebalancing, finally, our neurotransmitters. 
So food can be a double-edged sword where the foods we consume can provide nourishment and serve functional or optimal health in the body, building blocks for neurotransmitters and mood stabilizing effects, or the foods we, conser- we consume can drive destruction, damage, and dysfunction. So let's start with the gut. In my program, we do use the ketogenic diet actually as a foundational tool. And the reason being, a lot of us have heard and we've heard people talk about ketones and epilepsy. And we know that ketones have fantastic influence on the brain and cognitive effects, as well as the ability to stop in hit stop excitatory impulse that can drive seizure. That same excitatory impulse on a less extreme level is what drives anxiety. And we know in up-to-date research that ketones help to support GABA, and GABA is a feel-good neurotransmitter that helps with relaxation and slows down the racing mind. It's also what we look for as a tool with something like Parkinson's where we have physical tremors. So we're removing sugar and removing excessive carbs first, but then we want to get a little bit more strategic and start to remove sources of inflammation beyond your macros. Let's talk about some of the foods that could still be driving dysfunction in your body. And the reason we do this is because we've seen in studies that inflammatory mediating chemicals or chemicals of inflammation cross the blood-brain barrier, and they're seen in higher levels of people that deal with chronic depression and anxiety. So there's more inflammation going on, and that inflammation is impeding the function of our feel-good neurotransmitters docking to those receptor sites. So we look at something called the GALT, which is the gut-associated lymphatic tissue. This is the lining of our GI tract. And we know that if we're dealing with inflammation, let's say I bump my elbow on the wall as I'm passing through a room, I'm going to get swelling in that area, I'm going to get pain, I'm probably going to get a little bit of redness and maybe some tenderness to touch, and loss of function. I might not be able to bend that elbow as well or throw a ball. That same type of injury and and process occurs in the GI tract. So your body responds to inflammatory foods. This is extreme example, but I compare a corn chip to a stab wound. Because when you eat inflammatory foods, your blood shunts from your centralized area outward because it wants you to survive. It doesn't want all that blood to flow out. And we get reduced digestive function and we get bloating and fluid retention. And so if we're doing this on a day-to-day basis, it's hard to tell from mediocre to crappy what foods are affecting us. And that's why my goal is to try to help you identify how to get to optimal. So the five foods that I start with are gluten, which if we're doing the ketogenic diet, we've likely removed. But I'm talking about to the level of making sure that it's out of your sauces, um, making sure that we're not doing any uh, products that have gluten as a stabilizer in them. And the concern of this is the gliadin protein interferes with something called zonulin. And zonulin unlatches the gut lining, which creates larger particle flow into the bloodstream. So any consumption of gluten on its own is going to drive more leaky gut tendencies because of that unlocking mechanism. Casein and dairy are also pulled out of my anti-anxiety program because there's been studies on caseomorphin, which is a protein from casein. So whey and casein are the two forms of dairy proteins. Casein is the one that we've seen in research on manic bipolar disorder, depression, ADHD, autism. And we see that the casein can cross the blood-brain barrier and that that can also interfere with cognition and mood stability. We tend to have more susceptibility to casein intolerance if we have a low stomach acid, which is another chicken and egg relationship because stress lowers our our stomach acid. So that pH starts to come up as we're stressed. Um, So, or if we're on a PPI drug, how many of us take Nexium or some forms of Omeprazole or Protonics? And often we deal with heartburn also under stress. So if we suppress our stomach acid with a drug or we're getting low stomach acid from stress, we're going to be more susceptible to that casein and dairy having mood-disturbing influence and opioid activity, which can drive addictive tendencies. 
So I do use an enzyme um, called Digestaid, which has something in it called DPP4. This is my best friend when I dine out, and I have most of the clients in my clinic on it, taking it any time they eat out of their control and could have cross-contamination of gluten or that dairy form. And the DPP4 breaks down the gluteomorphin and caseomorphin, those inflammatory mood-interfering compounds in those two categories of foods. And then it also has ox bile to help to regulate your pH and has enzymes to help you break down food particles. The other foods I remove are corn, soy, and sugar. So I've talked about keto as medicine for anxiety, and we've seen in other studies that elevated blood sugar levels are two times more likely to develop depression and anxiety. And I was just talking with Carrie earlier today about this and how this vicious cycle of we go for the sweet, salty, crunchy, or sweet desserts for a pick-me-up when we're feeling a dopamine drop. Because dopamine levels in the brain do increase from sugar and fat, but sugar depletes the production of dopamine. So you get a spike from consumption, then you get a crash, and you don't have the building blocks to get that spike again until you keep reaching for that external sweetener and this unsustainable vicious cookie cycle. So regulating your blood sugar with a high-fat, low-carb diet alone is going to help with supporting mental health. And then the tool of those ketones, again, ketones actually can reduce your excessive stress response in the body and have you feeling more mellow because they help to support GABA. We also see that when we're in ketosis, we tend to have an increase of HGH, which is going to help our metabolism. Of course, we also see leptin influence, which can play with satiety. And we see influence on the mitochondria that's very favorable. I want to quick touch on the importance of detox with keto um, because a lot of us may be six months in. We may have hit a stall. Um, I have a great podcast episode on this. It's something in the 70s, so you can check it out. Um, but it's important to mention that as you are using body fat as fuel, you may be shrinking your fat cells, but you're releasing some of the contents of your body fat into your bloodstream. And so you're starting to take a bath in a warm bath that is filled with muck. You need to upregulate the detox process when you're doing keto at least quarterly or anytime you lose 10% of your body weight. So for someone that weighs 160 pounds, once they hit that 16 pound of weight loss mark, they need to do a detox. And a clinical detox has phase two supporting compounds from sulfur amino acids, and they help to encapsulate and excrete what was released in that metabolic process of using fat as fuel. So on to the next R. That was just removing inflammation, right? Um, so now we're talking about resetting the microbiome. The microbiome is initially populated at birth. The microbiome consists of 100 trillion cells in our body that outnumber the cells of our body 10 to 1. So we're really more of like a host for the biome that lives within. And our birth story, vaginal birth versus cesarean, has a huge influence on inoculation or giving that culture. In fact, if you read on my blog, we did vaginal seeding with my daughter. She was an emergency C-section. So we inserted gauze in my vaginal area and had that all in her eyes and her mouth and her nose and her ears within seconds of her being delivered um, to help to inoculate and seed what she missed from that passage. Breastfeeding also plays a huge influence on our microbiome. There's actually something called HMOs, human uh, milk oligosaccharides, that work to fight against pathogens and work to feed strategically the good bugs in the gut. And if we're in a state of symbiosis, which means balanced gut biome, we make more serotonin. In fact, 90% of the serotonin that targets our brain is manufactured by our gut by those two strains, lacto and bifido. And GABA, the one I keep mentioning, which is that neuroinhibitory mellower outer, is also manufactured by those good bugs. If we're in a state of dysbiosis or bacterial imbalance, we actually see an excessive output of epinephrine, which is like adrenaline. So that creates actually an agitated stress response when we're in a dysbiotic state. So we might respond to our kid not listening, um, our boss's instruction, our partner's feedback on the meal we made, a little bit more sharp and edgy and less mellow if our gut bike 
microbiome is off. So you can maybe blame it on your gut if you're being cranky. Um, and we actually see then also that secretory IgA getting damaged by that value as well. Sometimes you need to plow the fields before you can repollinate the good bugs. So I've had clients that will say, oh, but Allie, I don't tolerate kombucha or I don't tolerate sauerkraut. I get really bloated or I get a, a bowel change that's unfavorable or I get really flighty or I can't fall asleep. If I take a probiotic, I feel like there's an atom bomb going off in my belly. If you respond poorly to a probiotic, that is a way of diagnosing dysbiosis. In fact, at my table, we have instructions on a probiotic challenge that I do in my clinic where I start you taking three base measurements of your waist circumference from rise to rest to see if you're getting bloating and distension. Then you start with 15 billion colony forming units of a clean 50-50 blend. I use one called Restore Baseline Probiotic. And then in three day increments, you increase by 15 billion cultures. So you do 15 billion for three days, 30, 45, 60, and you watch for variances in those measurements, and you watch for variances within your mood, as well as your bowels, gas, bloating, and other inflammatory response. If you improve by going up the bell curve, then you want to transition to a 60 billion dose probiotic and maintain at that for a couple months to repollinate the good. If as you climb up that bell curve, you start to get decline or intolerance, you need to do a bacterial cleanse before you can proceed. And so I have an ebook called Beat the Bloat, and it's a six-week protocol that uses berberine and strategic compounds like oil of oregano to actually plow the field so that you can accept and tolerate the probiotics. And then in my book, I have food as medicine recipes as solutions, including a bacteria battling chimichurri. A great way to think outside the box for fat bombs is doing dips like pestos, chimichurris. These are great vehicles to keep your macros up at high fat and you get a lot of antioxidants using things like garlic and raw onion and then these herbs and seasonings and spices. I have a lime in the coconut fat bomb. We know that coconut oil has caprylic acid and monolaurin. These things fight against bad bacteria and yeast overgrowth in our body. And curry roasted cauliflower is another dish we use to combat the bacteria. And then to build the good, we do a chia seed pudding, a quick coconut yogurt, and a green chili uh, chicken soup, which uses jicama, um, which has a lot of inulin or prebiotic fiber. Again, that's good to feed once you've reset and you want to keep the good bugs alive, not if you're in a state of imbalance. So moving on to now that we've removed those inflammatory foods, right? So we pulled out all forms of hidden gluten, casein. We've pulled out the corn, the soy, and of course the sugar. Now we've reset the microbiome. It's time to rebuild that house or seal that tank of our leaky gut. So when we're talking about repairing our gut lining, it is essential for optimizing our mood stability and our brain function. Because we know that there are actually more neurons in the gut than there are the spine. You know, so we're calling this enteric nervous system or the second brain of the body beyond the central nervous system from the brain down the spine. We see that actual neuropeptides from stress influence the membrane of the gut and stress in itself creates relaxation in those junctions of the GI lining, driving more leaky gut. There's something called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, and this is a marker of uh, bacterial imbalance. And so we generally see this value to also create kind of cuts in the GI tract. LPS goes up in the blood if we have a pathogen. So if we have like clostridium or we have a bad bacteria overgrowth in our system, LPS will be measurable high. We've seen in social anxiety studies that LPS goes up in the blood from people that experience social anxiety. So just being stressed or anxious about a deadline or about an engagement or something can actually drive leaky gut on its own. And that's why we need to be proactive with adding these things that coat and soothe and repair. So bone broth is one of my best recommendations and best friends. Um, I consume it daily and 
And it's such a great tool for connective tissue, so our hair, skin, and nails, but it also plays a huge role with lining the GI tract. And bone broth has something in it called glycine. So if you heard the medical panel yesterday, we were speaking about how too much of like the white meats versus the poultry, if we're eating just the muscle fibers of protein and we're not eating nose to tail, we're gonna get too much methionine and not enough glycine, and that can drive inflammation. We need glycine actually to help with relaxation in the neuromuscular system. So actually reducing that clenching in our jaw or helping to take out that trap stress that we hold in our shoulders from working late at night or helping with depth of sleep and combating anxiety and insomnia. Because glycine in interacts with GABA and gives us that ah, feel good mood stabilizing effect. So bone broth mug at 9 p.m. is an awesome thing you can bring into your routine to help to combat insomnia or just promote more restful sleep. On a supplemental level, I use my super turmeric, which is four to six times bioavailable amounts of turmeric that you can get in an encapsulated form. I use an EPA DHA extra high dose omega-3 fatty acid and um, my GI lining support product, which has L-glutamine, the same amino acid in bone broth, as well as DGL and aloe, which is really kind of oopy goopy. It's called mucilaginous. It delivers the glutamine slow and steady to the gut to help to create that repair. And just like aloe is anti-inflammatory for a sunburn, you get that coating and soothing in the GI lining, um, which is gonna help with things like heartburn, reflux, so you can get off of those PPIs and reset your stomach acid as well. Moving on to now that we've rebuilt the house, now we can actually absorb our nutrients. So that's awesome. Um, you know, you start to absorb your nutrients in the intestines. And so if you have leaky gut, you're gonna get things passing through into the bloodstream like inflammatory foods, but also you're losing the nutrient absorption process. So micronutrients we see is playing a huge role with mood stability and managing anxiety and helping to be more resilient to stress. The first thing I start with is antioxidants. So when we're looking at oxidative stress, you may have heard from like skin commercials, free radical overload, whatever that term means, right? So free radical exposure we get from our EMF, um, bright lights, our blue lights. We get uh, free radical exposure from environmental things that we're breathing in from our industrialized society. Even if you're eating a 100% organic diet, you're gonna have oxidation damage in the system, and that's going to be accelerated if you exercise, because you're going through respiratory distress. So a marathon runner actually commonly has depleted antioxidant stores. So it is super important to think of these sulfur-containing foods like the Brussels sprouts pictured here, which are rich forms of cysteine and glutathione. These support the liver in the detox process, and they also give us a good repletion of antioxidants. Glutathione is the granddaddy antioxidant, and the little baby brother is vitamin C, and they work in a hierarchy. So in the middle there is things like CoQ10 and vitamin E and so forth. B vitamins are one of the best things to look for when we're looking at mood stability. So our B vitamins work as what are called cofactors for our neurotransmitters in the brain. So our neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA that I really hone in on for anxiety relief um, are built by amino acids or protein compounds. So you may have heard like tryptophan in your turkey helps you to feel mellow at Thanksgiving. Well, getting the building block of tryptophan is one step. Now you need B6 to help to convert that tryptophan into serotonin. And B vitamins, again, are going to be depleted with stress. So another vicious cycle. We need more B vitamins if we're looking to get out of the water and create that conversion from the protein in our diet into feel-good neurotransmitters. B6, folate, which is B9, and you want to look for folate in the form of methylfolate, L-methylfolate, um, or nature-made folate. You never want folic acid, which is synthetic and can drive issues if you have MTHFR genetics. And then B12 plays a huge role on neurological health. It helps with our myelin sheath, helping to line our nervous system, and it's going to help to create less stress activity in the body and less tremors and support circulation.
And then there's mood stabilizing minerals as well. So we're looking at magnesium, which is the original chill pill um, that actually helps to metabolize cortisol, the primary stress hormone, and it helps with muscular relaxation, and then zinc and calcium are super important as well. So if we're looking for food as medicine support here, we can get antioxidants from our berries, from cacao, so actually using raw cacao powder in our recipes. Um, you can do protein shakes with full fat coconut milk, add in some MCT or coconut oil, cacao powder or a nut butter too for extra fat, and um, some collagen and make a really balanced, homemade, clean, whole food keto product. Um, we're looking at roots like turmeric, ginger, herbs, teas, coffee, all of these being great antioxidant supporters. For magnesium, dark chocolate again. Chocolate makes it on my list a couple times. Nuts and seeds, nut butters, nut flowers, leafy greens are one of the best forces of B vitamins and magnesium. And then your avocados and your beets. And for zinc, we're going to look at mineral-rich proteins like oysters, Eating glands like liver is going to be extremely important and eating more of the darker red meats and such. So I spoke to methylation a little bit. What this is, is a biochemical process of building or excreting. And about 30 plus percent of the population has this genetic mutation where, again, they do not tolerate synthetic folate in that individual. That can drive a backup and that can create imbalance in this pathway, which can drive more catecholamine or stress responding chemicals in the brain and perpetuate mood imbalance. So moving on from restoring uh, your nutrients to rebounding your adrenals and then rebalancing your neurotransmitters. You all still with me? We're, we're getting there. Um, so rebounding your adrenals is super important because the adrenals make your cortisol. They also make DHEA. And DHEA is very important for the keto world to understand because DHEA is used as a building block to produce ketones. So both being in an overexcitatory state of adrenal output. Putting out too much cortisol can interfere with your ketone production, but also being in extensive adrenal fatigue and not manufacturing enough DHEA can inhibit you from making ketones. So the adrenals, being the fight or flight primary gland of the body, are really one of our stars of our metabolic show as well. And high DHEA is often a driver for infertility. So we like to use keto as a tool for things like PCOS and hormone regulation, but it's important to assess the state of the gland. So I do salivary testing in my clinic, as you can see that line graph. We want to be in an L curve where we're getting the natural birds chirping in the morning and then slowly cascading throughout the day. And I like to use, before I would bring in a glandular, like adrenal compound, I like to start with nervines and adaptogens. There's a formula I use in my clinic called Calm and Clear. So it has a blend of nervines like chamomile. Um, we're also looking at oat pod, shisandra, and shisandra berry, and then adaptogens. So nervines are calming, mellowing you out. Adaptogens help you to be resilient and adapt to stress response and combat that stress-induced fatigue. So adaptogens were including like Panax ginseng, ashwagandha, holy basil, cordyceps. So I have an adaptogen boost and the calm and clear formula and those can work very nice synergistically to support those stressed glands. It can help to regulate stressed and tired and stressed and wired. And vitamin C is extremely important. One thing you can do daily is use citrus um, and you actually zest your citrus. So you're getting those bioflavonoids from your lemons, your limes, your grapefruit, that's a great way to ramp up your vitamin C. Add that to salad dressings, use them as water infusions, and vitamin C helps to modulate your adrenal output. You store the most vitamin C in your tiny adrenal glands in your system. The last R is rebalancing our neurotransmitters. So there are actually over 100 neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, and our lifestyle, our stress, our sleep, our demands, the amount of time we're staring at a screen, and cognitive and emotional influences are all going to play what neurotransmitters are turned on and which ones are turned off. And then as I mentioned, the gut has its own agenda in what it's going to manufacture based on the players that are living in your biome. 
So the inhibitory or the mellower outers or mood stabilizers for stress and anxiety are our serotonin, our GABA, and our glycine. And I think I've spoke to all of those at this point. And then those excitatory are our epinephrine and norepinephrine, kind of known as adrenaline collectively. And then dopamine, that reward seeking, and glutamate. Um, and glutamate is something we also want to watch for in processed foods. If we're still eating fast food, there's a lot of MSG or monosodium glutaminate in these foods. And even if it's a protein, like a burger patty, that can throw and jack your anxiety through the roof, creating mood imbalances. So tools to stabilize your neurotransmitter. Um, L-theanine is a great tool. This is found in matcha in its highest concentration. And matcha helps to modulate. It kind of helps to swing both ends of the pendulum. It doesn't drive production of one neurotransmitter. Instead, it helps to conduct and drive balance. It actually increases the alpha brain waves. And these are what are seen during meditation um, or focus, creative thought process, and also in your REM cycles of sleep. So if you're not dreaming, you're likely not having optimal neurotransmitter function in the brain. And then as I mentioned, your building blocks for neurotransmitters come from protein-rich foods. So amino acids are coming from our protein. So ensuring you're not going too low protein is a really important thing to consider. Watching for symptoms like hair falling out could be a symptom of low protein or chronic fatigue. And the protein as a building block, again, has to be supported by those B vitamins. And then CBD is a compound from cannabis which has no psychoactive influence. It is legal in all states, so it's not considered medical marijuana. Um, but CBD also has an influence on our CBD1 and 2 receptors, which can help to reduce excitatory function, can help with that GABA receptor, and can help to support our immune system. So in my book, I make a strong argument for each of these R's, and each chapter has a quiz to help you figure out which entry point is your most important. Because it would be totally overwhelming if you had to do a candida cleanse at the same time that you had to rebound your adrenals, at the same time you had to focus on your minerals and your chelates, right? So I actually give you a quiz per chapter so you can determine which one you need to hone in on, and then which ones you may want to consider bringing in supplemental support on top of diet strategy. And I've organized my 40 plus, not 30, 40 plus recipes into each R so you know which recipes are more focused on rebounding your adrenals or which recipes are more focused on rebalancing those neurotransmitters. And it has a two week meal plan and advanced lab recommendations if you feel you're experiencing one of those big R's of imbalance. Um, some of the snacks that are included are prosciutto wrapped asparagus, olives with turkey, bell peppers with spicy cashew cheese. Um, we do a lot of nut cheeses, and I mentioned that quick coconut yogurt as an alternative to dairy. Celery with tahini, kale chips. So you'll see all of these have phyto compounds or plant-based antioxidants and drive with fat to keep things stabilized. Um, I'm going to open for Q&A, uh, but if you'd like to learn more about me and what I do, I have a booth right up there. Um, it'll say my name on it, Allie Miller. You can follow me on Instagram at Allie Miller RD. I have a podcast called Naturally Nourished, and each episode is very specific from hypothyroid to women's hormones to insomnia and beyond. And we try to give you functional approaches, tools, and then food as medicine solutions. So I hope you'll join me on the journey. I scare everyone away from questions. Maybe. It's like I saved five minutes on purpose. Oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh oh. Hello? Oh, there Hi. we go. When did you say your book was coming out? July 17th. You okay. can pre order it on Amazon, though. What type of magnesium do you recommend? Magnesium bisglycinate. Um, I have, uh, if you want to come to my booth, I have one called Relax and Regulate, and it's a magnesium bisglycinate and inositol. Um, and inositol helps with intracellular signaling and has been shown to reduce anxiety and balance hormones as well. 
Um, but bisglycinate, and um, you want that because it's chelated, it's more neuromuscular relaxing, and um, about 200 milligrams as a minimum dosage. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, I have a question about, uh, have you have any experience with patients with de salt depletion, hyponatremia? How does it affect the gut lining and uh, how do you deal with it in this case? So especially if we're going from a processed diet to a whole foods based diet, hyponatremia compounded with keto as a, as a transition can be very serious and I see that very often. Um, and it's really connected to the adrenal glands because your adrenal glands make aldosterone. I didn't mention that because it's not extremely relevant for today, but aldosterone regulates your sodium retention in the body. Right. So it's, if you're, you should absolutely go for a minimum of two teaspoons of salt a day. Um, and I would recommend, especially if you're dealing with keto flu or you've had low sodium in, in your blood, like a comp, and you've seen low sodium, um, that you manage and, and monitor that and check into the adrenal gland as more of a resolution because that individual may also have adrenal fatigue and that's where they're not getting that regulation or maintenance of the sodium that's being consumed. Thank you very much. Sure. Great presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes I answer a little too high-powered host. Uh, my question is about oils uh, uh -huh. for keto. Is it possible to do too many oils? And then as a second part of the question, uh, my mom's been doing the same keto program as me, and uh, it seems like it's thinning her blood where she's getting some spots showing Bruises. up, and it's almost like it's too thin. Bruising, but also the little spots. And uh, if she scratches herself, she bleeds. Is there? Uh, what's your opinion about that? So... Um, I'll answer that one because I already forgot the first question. But <laughs> Bru the bruising and the thinning in the skin, um, one thing that I watch for is making sure they're getting enough vitamin K. So in increasing the leafy greens that are being consumed is really important. Um, and then also looking at that snout to tail philosophy of eating, getting more glycine, getting bone broth, getting liver, getting glands and organs. Because when I, I mentioned that if you eat too much just meat muscle protein, that can throw up your methionine and that can drive your homocysteine off and that inflammatory marker can drive the, the skin thinning as well. Okay. And then the, the first part Let's of the question that. is, uh, can you do too many oils for your source of fat? As compared to... Uh, I'm not, like, like, you know, you switching mean, to keto, I've had a hard time doing 200 grams of fat per day. Uh, so I use a lot of oils in a smoothie in the morning, like 160 grams of fat worth of oils. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, I would look to bowel tolerance, okay. and I would, you know, watch how your body's responding, checking your blood ketones and whatnot. But um, I like to keep MCT oil as a kind of more processed or broken down, industrialized oil moderate. It's a great tool and I like to keep it in the diet, but I don't like to go over like two tablespoons of that. And then depending on your oils, making sure that some of them are cold, um, unfiltered, unprocessed. So like actually using a blend of olive oil, like I mentioned with those dips, in addition to things like tallow and lard and ghee and getting good rotation, um, I don't see any problem then. Um, okay. But that would include the saturated solid fat spreads and oils right. all in that. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi, Allie. Hi. Um, I have a friend who has a lot of sensory overload after having had brain surgery, and um, he's in a constant state of fight or flight, and so he's having a lot of uh, difficulty contemplating making a lot of the changes um, yeah. to his diet. So what would be some of the like, three top things you might recommend to kind of try to bring him out of that fight or flight? So um, supplement-wise, I would recommend I have a GABA chew called GABA Calm Chew. It's the bomb. I have a two-year-old, um, and I take it every time I take her to music class. And instead of feeling like, oh, my God, my child won't listen, I'm like, you are a beautiful, creative little being. <laughs> and we're in this together, Stella. We're in this together. And it did, um, did, do you take that, or you give that to I her? take that. <laughs> I took that before getting on stage. That's why I'm not tremoring. Um, and so, yeah, GABA Calm is the bomb for that. It's, it's going to give you that mellow, immediate. And because it's chewable, it's a pretty immediate onset. Um, the other thing I would look at is um, phosphatidylserine. That helps to block excessive cortisol output. Um, and, you know, I would definitely look at monitoring and checking in on cortisol and um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, getting some neurotransmitter feedback. And often, you know, I'm, I'm not 
in theory a pill pusher, but often for that exact case of if you're in such a state of imbalance, you need to get above water before you can make these, tr these dramatic dietary changes. And so giving them the tools to start to feel confident and balanced in their body again, I think is very important. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I think that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Allie Miller, ladies and gentlemen.